And we pray for Tim. Would you help him not to bore us or send us to sleep? Would you help him to bring the very words of the living God that we would be on fire for you in this city? In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that prayer. Thank you so much to those who are leading us in worship and those the tech team, <laughs> Sunday club leaders, those who've lent us the building, those who laid the carpet and those who cleaned the windows, but most of all to you, well, penultimately to you, mostly to the Lord, and with that I finish. So here we are, we're in the uh, Apostles' Creed. We've been in there a while because there's a lot to look at. We're in a season of life where life is accelerating at an extraordinary pace. We know some of it in technology, in cryptocurrency, the list goes on, some of it, but we know, we do not know yet the impact of it all. To the power of COVID-19, uh, the disruption that brings, to the uh, carnage, that uh, not being able to do things, etc. It's difficult, but we're in a s season of incredible transition and shift and change. The reality is, if you look through history, that's been going on for some time. There have been plagues, there have been earthquakes, there have been wars, there have been shifts in technology. Do you remember that time when we went from stone to iron? I mean, it was big, right? Not as big as three, Web 3.0, but it was big. What do the people of God do at times like this? Run around in a panic. No, we ground ourselves with the Lord. And here this morning, we're looking at this whole question again of I believe. The creed constantly says, it starts with I believe, I believe, I believe. And uh, throughout this series, I hope you've heard us say that I believe does not mean I ascend, assent to. It's not a tick box exercise. That, that is a form of godliness, but with denying its power. It's actually taking it to heart, in, in, in embracing it in our operating system, seeing it working in our bodies, so that everything that we do and say, everything that we are, is taken up with him. But there's a fight, isn't there? There's a battle between one and the other. So I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, typically what that means is, when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we mean, right, lots of people, it's growing fast, and we can bring in some verses from Acts 2 and 4, if you want, uh, the group by 5,000 people, it's amazing, and all that, 4,000 people, and it was amazing, 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 lots of people, very fast, very noisy, it's extraordinarily noisy, hallelujah, hallelujah, and there's a pace, there's a noise and there's crowds of people. And that's what I was brought up on. The only snag is that when in the 6th century, some of you were teenagers then, but in the 6th century, um, when, that was rude, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I get it, I get the feedback already, I receive it, I acknowledge that. In the 6th century, there was a, a lot of change shifting around. Rome had fallen, and, and there's a great power play. And pe people start, the Christians started to say, this is gone mad. The whole church has gone pear-shaped. The society has gone so secular, so fast. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll move into the desert, and we'll be the desert fathers and the desert mothers. And they were known for three things that they rejected because they were following God. They rejected hurry. They rejected crowds. They rejected noise. So it's been making me think as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, when we say I believe in the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying things don't happen fast in his presence. I'm not saying things are not noisy in his presence. I'm not saying that extraordinary things don't happen in his presence. What I'm saying is be, please be discerning in 2022 as to what the Lord is doing. Please don't look back into history and say, oh, he's doing this. Or look back into history and say, oh, I wish he was doing this. Let's fix our eyes on him as we say, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. Over the next few weeks, we're looking at, I believe in the, the church, the Holy Church. And I tell you what, I've got a problem with the church. And I love the church. Secondly, uh, we're going to be looking at the, holy, uh, the um, forgiveness of sins. 
And I'm going to help us to see why our understanding and f- coming face to face with our sin is probably the best move we'll ever make because it where it, of where it leads us. Uh, and then we'll go on from there. But those, these are the three things in the next three weeks. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Press a button. So what does it look like to believe in the Holy Spirit? I, I, I sketched out a sort of what it might look like. Firstly, your whole life is a place of worship of the Lord Jesus. Your whole life, nothing hidden, everything before the Lord, private and public. Your internet history through to your um, ablutions, everything is before the Lord because the Spirit of God is with us. We're in his presence. Your life and your death, Everything about who you are, what you long to be, is all tied up with him. And then, as, as the years tick by, or various circumstances unfold, we start to come face to face with our mortality. And, and then we get, we rightly a bit concerned about that, a bit panicked about that. But even in that, we say, Lord, everything unto you. My times are in your hands. My hopes and my fears. Sex and sexuality. We say, well, look, th- this is wh- who I've become, and I want to put everything unto the Lord. I want to honor him with my body. I will hide nothing from him. In fact, I can hide nothing from him. I will stop pretending that I'm hiding something from him. And therefore, being open with him, I'm beginning to be open with others. Money and more. These are kind of the swear words in, in church, aren't they? Money. How much do you earn? Not telling you. Of course you're not telling me. I'm not asking you. But, you know, I'm making you feel awkward because that's the point, right? We're a little bit concerned about money. We're very happy to have money, but as long as we keep it over here. Well, everything belongs to the Lord. All things have we come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. So money and more. Do we need plenty? Have we got enough? Contentment, etc. Brokenness and sin. Even brokenness and sin becomes a, a place of worship of the Lord Jesus. I need him. I I need him to move into my life and inhabit me. And whilst he's indwelling me, I still sin. I'm a saint by his grace, but I still sin. Sometimes I don't mean to. Sometimes I think about it and mean to. And by his kindness and in his grace, he then would draw me back to himself and I say, look, in this mess, I come to you. In my brokenness, which may involve my sin or someone else's, else's sin, but it's certainly under the conditions of fallenness, not everything goes to plan. So even in that, I come to him. A little bit of code for you computer programmers out there. Uh, even in example and example, y- you fill in the blanks. Your whole life, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, your whole life is a place of worship of the Lord Jesus. Through suffering and pain and trouble, you're becoming more like Jesus. Now, this is news to us, right? Because in church, what we tend to say is, how are you? Fine. How's the pandemic going? Oh, mustn't grumble. Get real. And all God's people said, Through suffering and pain and trouble, we're becoming more like Jesus. As we say, and I say it constantly, I wish the Lord worked through ice cream in holidays. But he tends, he does do that, and I wouldn't rule it out. But he tends to work through when things are difficult, and I'll show you why. You experience peace and contentment in him. How's that possible when everything around is shifting, the ground is moving and it's all gone wrong and you've got bad news everywhere? There's a psalm that says you have no fear of bad news. Go and look it up, Google it. But you experience peace because we are filled by him, our eyes are on him and everything around us is going pear-shaped. But we're saying actually, by your grace and your mercy, I'm relating to you. Everything you experience is a reason to believe, even your doubts. In fact, your doubts, so often I find, are a reason to say, Lord, I don't believe you exist. Can you make this, can you, can you just clarify it? Pray your doubts. Secondly, the Bible is your foundation and motivation. You find your identity and purpose in his story. 
If you're constantly um, on social media or in the IKEA catalogue and you're saying, I don't understand what my purpose is in life, I'd say, I'm not surprised. Let's spend some time in Scripture. Read through the Scriptures after you've read Gentle and Lowly. Read through the Scriptures and find your place in his story. It's going to take time because the Holy Spirit is thoroughly equipped for every good work. 1 John 2, 27, you don't need anyone to teach you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit teaches you all things. It'll protect you from false teaching. Get into the scriptures personally. Really understand your place in his story. And the, the harder life gets, the deeper you go with Jesus. You get that phone call, you get that message, you get that something doesn't pan out, so you go dutifully and you open the fridge or you open something, but full of the Holy Spirit, we open our hearts and we say, Lord, help. And your time in the Bible is where you hear his voice and enjoy the Lord. For some, you haven't read the Bible for yourself for months, and this is a great invitation to say, come on, come on. For others, you've read the Bible in a year for 40 years. And it is amazing, but for some of us, it can get a bit crusty. It can become, even that can become a work. Because, and you know when it's becoming work, because if you miss a bit, you feel guilty. Whatever it takes, empowered by the Holy Spirit, be in the scriptures, hear his story, find yourself in his story. We say, oh my goodness, look out on the news, what's happening, can't see God anywhere, read the book of Esther. Thirdly, you're seated as part of Jesus' church, and I don't mean on these glorious blue seats, I mean seated with him in heavenly places. That's your primary outlook in the workplace, at home, with children, bereaved, struggling, separated, hungry, eating too much, all of it. Our primary outlook is as one seated with him in heavenly places. If we're in Christ, we're seated with him in heavenly places. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of that. And as we're seated as part of Jesus' church, take your place and stand among a small group of people hungry for God. This is, we, we can't be a service provider. I hope this is of benefit to you and it's really encouraging. But it won't be nearly as encouraging as meeting with a smaller group of people and being transparently honest with one another. I'm afraid this is a bit one way, isn't it? I'd love you to be more, it'd be more two way if we had a couple of hours. But the reality is I taught you listen. And I'm, I'm as bored of it sometimes as you are. But the Lord in his grace is kind to us. But isn't it amazing that he would draw us into smaller groupings that we might speak transparently and honestly with one another. You're amazed at how God is at work in his world. You start to see, actually, the Holy Spirit's, the Holy Spirit's at work in, in, in my workplace. Look what he's doing. The, the Lord is transforming my marriage. The Lord is getting my attention. And you're humbled at how he uses you. And you're honest about yourself and your need for God. Transparently honest. This would take a miracle of massive proportions, wouldn't it? I mean, for that sort of stuff, and that's just a short list, but for that sort of stuff to be anywhere near our experience, we would need a miracle of heavenly proportions. Let me show you what God has done. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There we go, verse 2, Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. We could read through the whole of the scriptures, and we will see that everything God does, he does as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is, is mentioned and commented on and revealed throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. He is going about the earth, drawing people to Jesus constantly and perpetually. It's a nightmare to preach on this, because where do you stop? 
I'd never seen that as a problem, so I carry on. World without end. Genesis 2, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, and the breath, it breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. He breathed into human beings, and the man became a living being. What does it mean to be a real person, a real human, someone full of the Holy Spirit? Problem. Genesis 6, and the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. Used to be. There's this great withdrawal somehow, where the Spirit of God withdraws from the people. Well, read, read the scriptures, go all the way through, but it's interesting that the Holy Spirit is mentioned. So God it withdraws his closeness, withdraws his meeting, and then we get this verse in Exodus 31. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs. And this is rightly understood to say, well, isn't the Holy Spirit involved in all sorts of... Um, Graffiti and, and sculpture and, and, and wonderful works of art. Well, yes. But specifically, look what he's making. To make artistic designs, the tent of meeting, the Ark of Covenant law with the atonement cover on it and all the other furnishings of the tent. Isn't it interesting? As the, the Holy Spirit is explicitly mentioned with Bezalel, what is he making? He's making the place where God and people meet. Genesis, two, Genesis 6 the Lord withdraws, Exodus 31, we need to establish a place of meeting. Matthew 1, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. How will God and human beings be able to meet? Well, Belazel, Bezalel, the old, that fella, he was making this place of meeting as he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and conceived Jesus, the place of meeting, the tabernacle. She will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Savior. The Lord saves Yeshua, Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Then what happens? 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Look at the way it works. The Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit is breathed into people. The Holy Spirit somehow withdraws. Bezalel establishes this artistic designer, fantastic piece of art, which actually is the place of meeting. It sort of works, but doesn't. Have to be repeated, repeated, repeated. Then God steps into time and space in the person of Jesus, in the incarnation, as the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. And then... Look back at what we've talked about with the creed or talk to us more about it. Fill in the gaps with cross and resurrection, an extraordinary miracle. And then you and I sitting here in 2022, your body is a temple. I'm not trying to chat you up. I'm trying to quote scripture. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your important in this city because God dwells in you. And this took a miracle of massive proportions. That God created everything. And we're still discovering new things that we didn't realize were there. So the creation is still extraordinary and profoundly broken. Jesus is the God-man. What did it take? Well, it took God to become human, it become fully God and fully man, to live and die and take our place. He died, and in him we died. I'm just trying to make, go through this 
too fast and we don't like pace. We don't like hurry. Oh, I've got myself in the eye for that one. Jesus was raised to life and in him we are raised and the Holy Spirit draws us to Jesus and convicts us of sin, righteousness and judgment. And Paul says it in a different way here. In Ephesians 2, you are, you, in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So a working, practical theology, a pneumatology for 2022, it, it, look around. This is what it looks like. The people of God inhabited, indwelt by the Spirit of God. And if you're here and you're not a believer today, well, I wouldn't want to stay where you are. Give your life to him and invite him in. But if we are a follower of Jesus, look how he describes us. There's a perennial problem. And it happens throughout the ages and throughout the scriptures. The people of God get in the people of God's way. Because the church we make gets in the way of the church the Holy Spirit indwells. What do I mean by that? Brilliant. At the prayer meeting on um, Thursday, someone who I won't embarrass said, um, isn't it good that we changed our name because then we could move? If we hadn't changed our name, we'd, have, we'd be confused. If you're new here and you don't get that, forget it. But if you are you'll get some of it. Isn't it interesting that we get fascinated and tied into what God has done, so then we trip over ourselves and we can't follow in him into what he is doing. The church we make gets in the way of the church God, the Spirit of God indwells. The, the, the church in the world is, is living and growing. It, it's decentralized. It, it's, it, it's out of control. It, it, the Spirit of God is empowering people to follow him in all parts of life. It's not regulated, but we try and regulate it. More about that next week. The church is declining, but Christianity is growing. This is something that has haunted me for 20 years, this quote, when I read this. What, what he means by that, what Philip Jenkins means by that, is the church that we create. It is, it, you, you know it, across the, the Western world, the church, the institutional church is in decline, in free fall. Looking around, it's a miracle that there's anyone here. And the church that Jesus inhabits by his spirit is on fire and growing like wildfire. It's just under the bar. It's just not very visible. I know where I want to be. And personally, with, among ourselves perhaps, some of the reasons that we do get in our own way is we say things like, well, the Holy Spirit's convicted me of something, and then someone else points it out in love, and I say, nobody's perfect. I know that you're wrestling with how I've spelt that and what I've left out, but I'm just illustrating, neither are you. You see, the reality is God is drawing us to repentance. And we say, no, no one's perfect, not me. And then we say stupid things beginning with at least. At least I'm not. Oh, look around, there's much more ungodly people here than I am. Oh, God must have brought you here to talk to you. And then we say, well, who am I to judge? It would be a good thing to, if you really love someone, to tell them. And our controlling theology for the whole universe is God is love. Where do you understand that from? Well, you can, you can get from scriptures from 1 John if you want, but you define what love is. And that's the transparent, transcendent theology across the Western world, it would seem. God is love. God loves everyone. It's fine. Who are you to judge? Nobody's perfect. Do you see where it goes? We cease to take what the Spirit of God is revealing to us in his word and to kindly and with gentleness and the love of God say something. We just cave in. And the controlling experience that we're longing for as churches decline to Sunday mornings is they would really believe the work of the Holy Spirit if God was really here, this would feel nice. 
Now, you're looking at me shocked. That's because you're an amazing church. You see, it's easy to have a form of godliness but deny its power. So let's bring this into uh, uh, land, if you like. How's this going to help? 2022, Omicron is coming to a slightly stuttering close. We're not looking forward to any future variants. We're looking forward to Sue Gray's report. I don't know if you're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to stuff happening. But personally, you see, if we sat down together and said, how are you? I think most of us would say, well, I'm a bit tired, if I'm honest. What's, what's really concerning you? Well, probably jab number four. Look what Jesus said. It, I have told you these things. Read these things today. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Oh my goodness, that's, that, that's what I, the Spirit of God, the dove, he, he descends upon me so that I might have peace. In fact, in Matthew 5 and 6, 6, he calls me a peacemaker, as he calls you a peacemaker, maybe it's 7. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. See the work of the Spirit of God? Quietly, gently helping us take heart, I've overcome the world. You see, where the Spirit of God is at work within us in January 2022, trouble triggers trust. Try saying that in a rush. I mean, typically it doesn't. But trouble triggers trust. I would encourage us to slow down to catch up with Jesus. I've been um, halted a couple of times this week by um, Claire, my wife, say, saying to me, oh, just breathe, say it more slowly. And we're, re- we're all kind of in, we're at the end of plan B, lockdown-ish, you know, how can I get, do it any slower? But, you know, they're still whizzing, whizzing, whizzing inside, slow down to catch up with Jesus. Look at the pattern of creation. There was evening and there was morning. At this stage, normally we say, well, get up an hour earlier, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Read half the Bible by breakfast time, then fast till lunchtime. Just do more, do more, do more. I don't know, how's that going for you? There was evening, there was morning. I wonder if the pattern of our days might be as we get up an hour earlier, if you want to, fine, but what about going to bed an hour, going to bed an hour earlier? Of just being with the Lord, bringing to him all the stuff until you fall asleep in his presence. Oh, maybe you're thinking, that's no good, that's not going to work, that's not very Christian, it's got to hurt. If it was really the Lord, it wouldn't be very nice. Try it. Just be with the Lord. Think through, thankfully, what, what's gone on in the day. And then think through, what's coming up tomorrow? Lord, I, I put this before you and I leave this with you. Last thing at night is a good way to start the day. Tweet that. And first thing in the morning is a good time to be seated with him. Seated with him in heavenly places. Rather than panic throughout the first hours, I know that having children can be a challenge and a joy. Sleep deprivation and all that, it happens and it's over in a moment and then you're worried about where they are and what they're doing in a different way. First thing in the morning, I'd encourage us to, to be seated with him. Ten minutes. Yep, scripture's open, but perhaps just sitting with him. Until you find him, he is your peace. Yes, read the scriptures, find yourself in his story. And then throughout the day, set a reminder to be aware of him. He indwells his people. I don't know if you've got a busy job or you've got a job that's just easy. I doubt it. 
most of the people in the workplace at the moment who seem to be quite engaged. It might be good to be smart, smart with our smartphones, perhaps, and put a little reminder in two or three times a day. A little alarm goes off. Jesus is Lord. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm not on my own. I'm surrounded by an angelic host, if only I could see. The list goes on. Slow down to catch up with Jesus. And if this is for you this morning, because we've actually, we, we're not physically maybe running around as much, but our mind is spinning out of control. Our heart is it's just constantly stressing us out. Slow down. To be with Jesus. And secondly, of three, and then we close, detach from the cycle of denial. I'm afraid this is how it so often works. I think I've been in this cycle um, until perhaps most um, decisively this time last year when the wheels came off and the cycle could no longer continue. But the cycle goes like this. You, you, you experience pain. You deny it. You deceive yourself. You make decisions in the, under those conditions and you experience deeper pain. Do, do you know what I mean? There's no nodding. Okay. So, you experience pain. There's no car park space and I'm here for church. I deny it. I say, it doesn't matter. So I say it doesn't matter, but I'm experiencing all the chemicals going off in here saying it really matters, it really, that's really annoying, it's really hurting me. And if I had hair, I'd be doing Michael McIntyre impressions. It's really painful. Something's happened. I, I deny it. Then I deceive myself. Well, if this was a church that really cared, they'd have saved one for me, wouldn't they? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, well, I thought I was. I'm just trying to make one up at the spot because you didn't nod. And then I start making decisions. So I walk in and I look around and I've already told myself that you lot don't care. In fact, you probably hate me and you wish I was gone somewhere else. Which leads to deeper pain. Isn't it horrible? Isn't it depressing? Is it true? No, it isn't. Do I believe it sometimes? Yes, I do. Did I get a car parking space? Is another story. But tell me, do you understand the cycle of, because this is how often people work. They, they, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and yet we, we don't live like it. Do, do, do you, Mark, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, Simon, do you think you understand what I'm saying? Don't have to agree with everything I say. You're a warden, you can tell me off. It's, it's, <laughs> we've got laws for that. Rod, have I explained, Rod and Sue, have I explained it enough, do you think? You think so? Okay. <laughs> Have a go. Go on. What's, what, if you're, how would the cycle of denial work? F or how is the cycle of denial working for you? Think of a pain. Think of how you have denied it. Didn't get that job. Didn't get the relationship. Someone said something unpleasant to you. Something fell apart. You say, at least, we had a load of parties set up, they were all cancelled by COVID, at least I didn't lose my head in a Frisbee accident, um, I deceived myself, oh, well, you didn't deserve it anyway, because you're, you know, and I make decisions to continue rather than deal with stuff, ends up with a deeper problem. Jung or Freud said that we bury live emotions like that and they continue to grow out of control. Have a look at that. Come on, we've gone over time, might as well keep going. Um, detach from the cycle of denial. W would you have a look at that? Because this this, if this is how you live, I'd love, it to, love you to see how this is really not going to help you because the next slide really is going to help you. But unless you help yourself, I can't help you. So have a look at that for just, um, just a minute. What's your, what, give an example of your pain. How are you, how are you denied yourself? Maybe you say at least, it doesn't matter. How are you, what are you believing? How are you deceiving yourself? What lie are you believing over a truth? What decisions have you made and how's it gone on? This may have been your life story. I think I probably spent at least 20 years in church work um, with, with a root system of this going on. And I tell you what, it's not very nice. 
and it's not very necessary. Over to you. I'll be quiet for what, one minute. If you want to, if it would help, talk to the person next to you. You've already infected them, so you might as well make most of it. If you don't get, get it, maybe ask them. And if they don't get it either, then um, the end will come. Okay, let me move on. Maybe you'd like to look at that again. It'd be worth going back and looking at this. And we've talked about emotional pain, perhaps, but what about sin when the Holy Spirit convicts of something? What do we do with that cycle? Let's move on. The last slide. Embrace the cycle of repentance and faith. When trouble comes into our lives... When you, when you realize that after, you can feel it coming for maybe 20 years and suddenly, this time last year, you just collapse, you can't do anything more. You thought you were strong, but actually you're a, a public example of weakness. Trouble hits. Sometimes transparency is forced upon us. The power of the Holy Spirit in us, when in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I overcome, uh, have overcome the world when trouble comes. We get to say, wow, I, I can't cope with this. Holy Spirit has convicted me of this particular sin. And because the Holy Spirit's made it public to me, I want to make it, I want to tell you personally. Don't come up, don't, don't be expected to come up the front and tell us all. That's not kind. It, it's, tell somebody. And what's the truth that the Holy Spirit has given me to believe in exchange for the lie that I have believed? Oh, this sin doesn't matter. Or it doesn't matter because it doesn't count for you. Because in that lies the transformation as we walk out into what God has for us. And sadly, as, su as night follows day, as the sun rises, tomorrow we'll have the troubles of its own, the scripture says. I'm going to get such feedback for going over time. Um, but I just want to give us a minute. How is that for you? This is what I mean by the work of the Holy Spirit. As he's convicting us of our sin, as he's convicting us in a time of our trouble, as he's raising stuff in our lives, stuff that's been buried, pain, things that our parents said or didn't say, neglect of experience, traumatic life experiences, divorce or um, separation or, or, or bereavements, or things that we just squidged down in Jesus' name because he's raised from the dead and everything's just great. No, well, he's re raising it up that he might free us of it then he might replace it with himself. But if we continue in the cycle of denial, we end up in deeper pain. Whereas I believe this morning, it, uh, we would get to in, embrace the cycle of repentance and faith. I was walking in this direction. I realized, my goodness, I'm not going to deny that. I'm going to say, Jesus, you brought this into my life. I don't want this anymore. So I'm going to set it down. And I'm going to turn around, I'm going to take whatever you have for me. That's repentance, changing mind, change direction, metanoia. <coughs> metanoia. I'm going to hold on to the truth and I'm going to walk in the transformation that he brings. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the presence of your spirit. 
And I pray for each of us personally here and those um, gathering with us online. Holy Spirit, would you help us to see that you're a giver of life. I pray where we've run from you with things that are too painful, complex, that we thought were buried. Holy Spirit, would you raise them in us? Would you attend to those painful areas? And we pray, Holy Spirit, would you fill us again today? In Jesus' name. Amen.